Hi, Victoria. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Katarina. How are you? Good, good. Nice to see you. Yes, likewise. This should be such an interesting discussion tonight. Yes, I, I agree. I'm really looking forward to it. And I uploaded the PDF onto our Google Drive so everyone has access. And yeah, great. I was a little bit late. I had to do some things before starting the room. <laughs> So, but it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> They're still doing the things. Exactly. Let me put the lab website in the chat. Now the room looks so pretty. There it is. Okay, yeah, the, I'm really happy that our little team is here. So much fun. The discussion earlier today was really amazing too, but it's so early for you, but the, well, I'm driving to school, so I really couldn't, I have to focus. I mean, sometimes yeah. I'm, I could come in PTR form, but I just, I, I would just want to come and listen and talk. So I, I have to just focus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. It's, he's from Norway, but he's currently in Iceland. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. It was a great discussion. I love the variety of topics that we have. It keeps it always interesting. <laughs> yes, except it's so hard to miss them. <laughs> I feel like, oh, why does this one have to be right when I'm teaching? Or, um, but all of them are that way. It's we have such, yeah, we have we have kind of something for everyone, you know, no matter what your background or personal interest. I feel like. Yep. Um, oh, hi, Lucas. How are you? Hello. Doing well. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Oh, there you are. We, oh, sorry. Sorry. Hello. Sometimes my app doesn't show who's in the room. It's kind of mysterious. I hear a mysterious voice. So sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. My voice. Yeah, um, Lucas, I'm we we get, I'm very happy that you made it because you had, um, you know, you jumped in <laughs> very short term. So it's really great of you to come today and do this. It's really nice of you. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully I'm uh, prepared well enough, but I think it should be. Oh, well, who, who should else should forward. know more about your project? <laughs> right. <mean>. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it, it's uh, though about the project. I'm not, I'm not worried. So the, um, I don't know. Yeah, just you know, I'm new. I'm, I'm uh, never really done a something like this before. I guess. Well, then, I'm glad you're here with us. We are all usually very nice. Yeah. <laughs> if people Thank are not you. nice, we nice, we throw them out. So that's the rule. <laughs> and also, really, it's our job to make sure that you are comfy and you have a great time, and that it's easy. And yeah, no, that's that's the impression that's, I've. Got. That's our yeah, job. Both very nice. So it's uh, it'll be good. I'm excited. Yeah, it's that very different from like a regular setting where you have to be scared that people will try to tear you apart. <laughs> you right. Yeah, I guess a little that's, different. Yeah, than the than the conference. Yeah, usually presented. used to. <laughs> right. I don't know. I think it got better. I I think when I started back in time, my masters like old professors were still out there to get you, but I think people got nicer even in science over time. <laughs> 
I think so too. I mean, now, yeah, you go to a conference and, and somebody can give quite a poor presentation and nobody tears into them and said they just feel kind of bad. So it's, it's nicer in that way. <laughs> but I think uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, society in general is pretty. Oh, yeah, nice. I had Maybe professors, the they would I... literally tell you, what are you even talking about? <laughs> 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 Anyways, <laughs> um, sometimes yeah. though you do, you know, I've I've needed to hear that in the past, so it's good when people are willing to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> okay. I oh the time is up. Uh, we um it was a nice chat, um but I think we can start now. So welcome everyone to Science Society. I know that people will still um keep coming in. But um, let me give a short introduction first, and then uh, Victoria will do um, the rest of the intro in the interview format. Um, and then we'll go from there. So um, welcome everyone to Science Society. And of course, a special welcome to you, uh, Lucas. And um, Dr. Lucas Reinhold Gabert, um, he is a research associate in mechanical engineering. Um, he did his uh, Bachelor of Science in the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. And then he did his master's degree at the University of Utah and uh, his um, PhD in robotics at the University of Utah. And uh, it's such an honor having you here. And as I said, I'll hand over the mic to Victoria for the rest of the introduction. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Katarina. And Lucas, um, I don't think that we're going to ask you, what are you even talking about? Even if you said that's what people okay. should ask. <laughs> I think we're going to refuse, right, Katarina? <laughs> Good. Good. We're in agreement. Great. Okay. We won't ask him. Okay, so thank you for coming. Welcome to Science Society. We are really excited to hear what you have to talk about. This this research is really going to be life changing for people, and I can't wait to hear you describe it and the development of it. And so, my question to you is. Where do you think your passion for science came from? And, and that can be answered looking back through your childhood or any time in your life, really, if you can think of when that initial spark struck you. Yeah, um, so I think uh, maybe this is slightly different than a lot of folks on Science Society, but um, I have maybe less a passion for science and more, more for engineering and, and for um, uh, helping folks with disabilities. So uh, my mom has a, is like a high level quadriplegic. So she has a um, spinal cord injury. And so my whole life I've kind of been around uh, disability. And I, I, I actually realized this just a couple months ago, but the, um, I had teddy bears as a kid and I named them elevator, lift and escalator, which is, I think, not very normal, but um, just kind of showed from a young age, uh, thinking about assistive devices. Um, and so, although, you know, I didn't know those terms, but, but I, and I always had a fascination for machinery. So like many kids, um, but, and then through uh, high school, I always liked STEM fields. Um, I really liked physics. I find physics very interesting. And then I kind of, uh, thought engineering was, was a good medium between physics um, and, you know, using, uh, uh, being able to help people, I guess, but, but still, uh, what am I, what am I, you have um, the, the hard STEM ability, but then also the soft skills of, of helping people. And so engineering is able to bridge that gap specifically in assistive technologies. Um, although I didn't know all this at the time when I did my undergrad. So I went to uh, engineering, did my undergrad in engineering and mechanical engineering, um, and then decided to come to a master's at the University of Utah. 
And I was lucky enough to find an advisor here. Uh, so that's the person who I did this work that we're talking today under. Um, that's uh, Dr. Tommaso Lenzi. And he has a very nice vision, I think, for assistive devices. And so um, I, th I guess I'm less interested in the science because there's also science in, in assistive devices of like how people move, how can you help them? And like when you help them, how does their body change? What's the biomechanics behind it? Um, and I think I'm less interested in that science and more interested in, in the technology and how can you design technologies to help assist people? Um, so that's the kind of wavy path to, to, the, to that uh, question. Yeah, thank you very much. And and that's it's so interesting that you named your teddy bears elevator lift and escalator. It really does show um, it's like a, um, it foretells your future in a way, you know, or just or just really shows what your interests were. And I, I get that. Um, we feel here that everything is interrelated. Disciplines of study are not really they're only separated because of necessity in school you know, regimentation and, mm -hmm. and being necessary to focus. So what may be wavy to some um, seems like a very direct path, especially when you explain that you wanted to apply, you're applying the physics to your engineering and it, it is all science. So thank you for that, that description. And so now that's where you are at. You were, you met that advisor and that's who you're working with on this project right now. Is that what mm -hmm. you had said? Yeah, great. Okay, so then I won't ask you how you got from there to here because you brought us here. So at this point, uh, the stage is yours and Katarina and I are here to help you field questions. People may put questions in the room chat and we will we don't we will look at those and, and share them with you. You don't have to. And then some guests may come up on stage and ask you questions at the end, um, like a Q&A. So okay. If there's anything we can help you with beyond that, um, here we are. So the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Lucas. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and feel free, I think, to jump in with questions um, at any time or kind of point me in a, in a direction if um, you think that's better. So I'll just start, I guess, with the big picture. So this, this um, paper published recently uh, is about a prosthetic knee and ankle. Um, which has power to help people move around. So a little bit of a background um, on prosthetics in general. Prosthetics have been around for a very long time uh, and the technology has changed significantly in the last 100 years. So we've gone from knees that are just a hinge joint, basically a door hinge. Um, and so it swings forward when you're walking, but it, it's not very stable. And then in the about 50 years ago, uh, researchers started looking at microprocessor controlled devices. And so these are knees um, that, so I'm back up a little bit, I guess, I'm just gonna focus on the knee first um, because it's hard to switch between knee and ankle all the time. So I'm just gonna focus on knees uh, for the first little bit. The Knees, so about 50 years ago, uh, researchers looked at, started coming up with microprocessor knees. And this means that instead of, it's, it's still a hinge, um, but there's a damper attached. And so you can change how hard it is to push that hinge. And so you can get quite complex with this. And these are still the knees that are in use today. Um, so when you're going downstairs or down a ramp, uh, you can push into it really hard and it supports you as it flexes, whereas a hinge would just buckle immediately under you. Um, and they have quite complex now algorithms now. If you stumble, they can help support you when you're walking. Um, they are developed by many different companies and they're on the market and they have been for, for about 50 years. So that's the kind of biggest leap forward in knee technology. There's, kind of, there's this... Um, you know, just a peg leg, right? A hundred years ago, then you move into hinges and then these microprocessor controlled knees. Um, and so in this work, what we're trying to do is take that next jump forward where we go from a microprocessor knee to 
a knee that can, um, instead of just being able to resist you, is able to help assist you. So it helps you walk up stairs, it helps you go up ramps, it gives you power when you need it. And we want to enable users to do activities that maybe they could do before their amputation and now they uh, don't do as often. So that kind of brings in the human aspect of this, which is um, the, if you, if you have an above knee amputation, it has a quite a significant impact on your quality of life. So uh, anything that we can do to help improve that quality of life is good. And a big way to do that is just getting people out and in the community uh, and walking to the grocery store because if you get an amputation and then you just uh, sit at home, it, it doesn't speak well um, for your quality of life. And thus life expectancy, there's many different secondary health concerns that come with that. Um, and most amputations in the United States are due to diabetes. So this is already a population that that struggles significantly with walking. So um, we wanted to design a device that can uh, provide all these benefits that, that can try to help people uh, walk and go upstairs and ambulate in the world. And this is not a question that is novel to us. Many groups have tried to do this um, and are still trying to do this, but it's a hard problem because it's, it's just a hard engineering problem. There's a lot of, when you add this motors, batteries, controls, you're adding a lot of weight to the device and uh, the weight and, and complexity really. So you decrease robustness because it's very complex. Um, and then you decrease the ability of people to move around on it because it's heavy. Uh, and the weight actually makes a, it makes a big difference. So you'll notice um, this is around the knee in this paper uh, is actually much lighter than the biological leg. And that's something that people are curious about. They say, well, if you make a knee that's the same weight as the biological leg, it should be fine to ambulate on. Uh, but you don't have all the connecting structure that you have for a biological leg when your leg is amputated. So it's just kind of hanging there on a socket. And so weight actually matters much more uh, than it does with somebody who doesn't have an amputation. Um, so that's some of the background for uh, the knee joint. Um, the ankle joint is, uh, has, a, has a similar justification. Um, microprocessor ankles do exist, although the most popular form of ankle today is uh, just a leaf spring essentially. So a piece of carbon fiber that flexes when you walk on it, um, and part of the reason that they're so popular, I, th I think, is twofold. One, uh, it's very lightweight. And when the farther away that weight is from your body, the harder it is to walk with it. So a heavy ankle is harder to walk on than a heavy knee. So adding weight to the ankle is, is really um, a, causes a lot of, has a lot of negative effects on, on walking. And uh, also the ankle is, less necessary in many gait tasks than the knee is. So for instance, standing up or going upstairs, the knee provides a lot of power, but the ankle doesn't. Um, so, but there's still many activities that you can assist with power in the ankle. Uh, you can provide better toe clearance. You can provide push off during walking, make it easier for people to walk. Um, so, that's the, the background on the need for, for these devices. Um, and powered prostheses have been under development in both knees and ankles for about 20 years. I guess longer if you count tethered systems, uh, which would be systems that are hooked up to a big machine. So you can't take them outside of the lab or, or go anywhere with them, but that researchers, um, more than 20 years ago started looking at uh, putting somebody on a treadmill and then having a prosthesis that's attached to big motors that's like in a lab where they can't walk more than five feet from the machine, but still giving power uh, to them. And um, yeah, so that, that brings us to uh, 
this device here where we're trying to create a prosthesis that can fit this lightweight um, uh, design requirement and be robust. Um, and so we can actually design a prosthesis that people can take home and, and uh, walk easily on because it's light. So um, we can look if folks have the paper. I think you posted a Google Drive link to it, Katarina. So um, yep. Yeah, I didn't want to see. overload the link you provided. <laughs> okay, yeah. You know, that way it's better. Yeah, so thank you for doing that. Um, if we look at figure one, we can see the design of the knee and ankle. So there's two separate modules. There's knee and an ankle. They can work together, they can work separately. Um, and there's a couple, in the design of this, so so people have tried for a long time to um, address this problem, but there's a couple things that we did differently or, or kind of uh, the novelty of this device in terms of mechanics is due to two main things in the knee and the ankle. So the kind of biggest one um, that I'll probably spend the most time talking about because it's, I think the most impactful outcome uh, or the, the contribution of this work is the torque sensitive joint. And so that's in figure one, that's at the top of the knee. And this is a joint that uh, we designed. This is primarily my co-author. So uh, Min Tran, he did all the math and simulation and design of this torque sensitive joint. And he spent most of his time on the knee and I spent most of my time on the ankle. Um, but we, uh, contributed to both. Um, they're not, they're definitely not separate. And uh, so the, the torque sensitive joint in the knee is kind of the main contribution that allows it to be this lightweight. And then there's also um, in the ankle, the main contribution is this under actuated system that connects both the toe and the ankle joint. So um, I, yeah, I'll just lead you folks through the paper here. I think that uh, makes the most sense. So the way that our design framework works in the lab. So we start with a, a big picture approach and this is um, kind of the, this design framework is, is how the director of the lab likes to, to approach problems. So when we, and for most problems that we approach, uh, we use the same framework. You have this big picture problem, which is just we would like to help amputees, uh, help amputee mobility. And we want to, um, we think that the best way to do that is to design powered prostheses that are lighter and smaller than prostheses uh, available on the market or any research devices available. And so, um, so both we can try and push them on the market and uh, try to sell them to people, but also just having smaller prostheses that work better allows for better research. So it really helps both um, research and uh, industry. But, but the design framework is um, we start with mathematical simulations of this device. So we just have a, a um, simulation that we run in MATLAB, which is a kind of programming language for scientists and engineers that uh, some of you may be f familiar with if you, I don't know uh, the who exactly is listening, but it's essentially programming language. It's nice for simulations. Um, and we make a kinematic model of the device, which means we basically say, here's the motor um, and then these are the dimensions of the device or what the dimensions it could fit inside of. Uh, and we kind of want the design to be this certain way. So this um, is a slider crank mechanism, which maybe is a technical engineering term, but basically it means we have a, uh, a we have a, ball screw 
trying to think of, of uh, exactly how to explain this. Um, well, it's a slider crank mechanism. And I guess the, the details of that, if you are curious about the exact details, let me know in the chat. But I don't know how far into that I should go. Um, so we have this design framework. We put in the kinematics of the device and we simulate several you know, hundreds of millions of designs within this space um, using this, this design framework. And we come up with the top designs that are seem to have the lowest force on all of the components. So they're the most robust and they have the highest or the, the lowest requirements of the motor. Um, so you're not overheating the motor, you're not pulling too much current from the battery. And so if we look at figure two, uh, this shows the results of this design framework for the design we selected. You can see uh, figure two A shows for walking and stair ascent, what the torque um, and speed at the joint level is. So this is, the, the way we do this, this simulation is we take biomechanical data just from people walking and we uh, it, people walking, people going upstairs, people doing sit to stand, so different activities. And we put these inputs of the torque and speed at their joint into this framework. So we say, if we design our device to provide this same torque and this same speed, then what's the requirements um, of voltage and what's the current requirements at the motor? And so you can see that in figure to see we have uh, max voltage and then current RMS. And so this shows that in these simulations um, with the this torque adaptive uh, torque sensitive joint at the knee that I mentioned earlier, we're able to do both walking and stair sand tasks within the simulation framework, whereas without the uh, torque sensitive joint, we're not able to do both of those tasks. So um, through this design, we settled on, through, through this uh, simulation framework, we settled on this design that allows us, that kind of is at the limit of um, the smallest components and the smallest motor we can find, the lightest, uh, bearings, etc., but still allows us to perform the tasks that we want to perform. Um, and so let's see, oh, I didn't post the supplementary materials. Um, I think I might skip a little bit ahead to figure seven. So we'll just talk about the knee design. Um, this is a little bit more in depth. <clears throat> so, and, and what we're just gonna focus on here is this torque sensitive actuator. And that's mostly um, shown by figure seven B. So this torque sensitive actuator is kind of the secret sauce behind this knee. Um, and what it does is, if you're familiar with the with the torque, so you have some torque at the knee joint, that's what you're trying to provide. And torque is a force um, times a distance. And so if you're one meter away from some joint and you push on that, uh, try to rotate that joint at one, at one meter away with one Newton of force, that's one Newton meter. And so the way that this torque sensitive joint works is, it, uh, when you try to ask for some force, then there is a spring, there, there's a mechanism, this, this torque sensitive joint gives you a higher um, moment arm for that, uh, to, to try to provide that force. So let's say you have the knee, um, this is kind of difficult to do without a, being able to use my hands. So sorry for uh, 
moving around on this, but when you um, you have some force, if, if the knee is asking, let's say for 10 Newton meters, uh, it's pulling down on this mechanism here. So figure B, figure 7B, there's this spring actuated joint. Um, and that's where your motor is pulling. So it's pulling on this thing in a slot, on this joint within a slot. And when you pull on that, you create a torque around the knee. And so when the motor asks for, when you ask for a torque at the knee, you pull on that joint. If you pull harder, you extend the spring more and your moment arm increases. So through that mechanism, the uh, torque at the joint, your torque ratio or your reduction, your, your transmission ratio increases when you ask for more torque. And so this just allows us to perform both tasks that require high speed and low torque and tasks that require high torque and low speed um, is this, this torque sensitive joint. So if we go back to uh, the results, um, to figure two, you can see that in walking, uh, you have lower or higher speed requirements. This is figure 2A. You have high speed requirements. You can see that in the second plot and you have uh, low torque requirements in walking. So we can perform both that activity because when you're not asking for a lot of torque, you don't get a higher reduction ratio. Um, and then in stair ascent, we're asking for low speeds, but high torques. And you can do that as well because when you ask for high torques, you get a higher reduction ratio at the motor. And that's shown by the second part of that fi of, of figure two, um, which shows that in walking, the torque ratio, uh, or sorry, in stairs, the torque ratio increases um, during this high torque activity. It also increases in walking during stance, uh, which is fine because that's the low speed part of walking. So anyway, that's uh, kind of a lot on that torque sensitive actuator, but that's um, the meat of what uh, makes the knee different. And so um, then there's figure three, which is a characterization of the knee. And this kind of uh, figure is in the paper mostly um, to show the performance. It's, it's kind of an engineering specific figure that just shows with some standard metrics for the engineering community, here's how well the knee performs. So this provides some reference for other devices. So if you wanna look at the um, impedance of the device, uh, for instance, and compare it with the impedance of a, a device somebody else publishes, um, you can use this figure. And so this, is, this isn't necessarily important, I think, to, to understand uh, the knee itself, but mostly to make comparisons with other devices. Um, and same thing with the, with the ankle as well. And actually, so for the ankle, um, the contribution of that is a, uh, this underactuated mechanism that connects the toe joint to the ankle joint. So there's a, a um, if we look at figure eight, A that shows the kinematic diagram. And essentially what this mechanism does is when you're walking, you flex your toes in late stance. So you walk, you roll over your foot. Um, and when you're pushing off your toes flex and we use this flexion of the toe to actually provide assistance to the ankle joint. That's essentially what this does. And so by uh, using this toe flexion, we can reduce the requirements on the motor and we can get away with a smaller device with smaller batteries um, because we have less power output from the motor and less power requirements at the motor. And so using, uh, yeah, so that's that's the design of the knee and ankle, and then we we take these these two mechanisms that um, themselves are uh, 
they're, they're, they're novel mechanisms. Um, of course, they build on other uh, things within the field. So like for instance, torque sensitive joints are not, um, this isn't the first, tense, first torque sensitive joint ever made by any means, but it's the first one put in a knee prosthesis. And with this, uh, with these kind of design ideas and design parameters. Um, and so from that, then we can use these uh, two devices now to do all sorts of activities. And so that brings us to figure six, which just shows a bunch of different activities um, performed and I guess figure five. So we had some subjects, we had three subjects come. These are folks with above knee amputations and they walked on both uh, the knee and ankle together and we had them perform a bunch of tasks. And so we can see um, figure six is just a big matrix of plots essentially. It shows knee angle, knee torque, uh, ankle angle, ankle torque, <clears throat> and same with the toe. And we can see that with using this device, we are able to uh, get similar profiles in walking, um, in stair descent and stair ascent that we get, that able-bodied people get. So this is promising. Um, it's not uh, a comprehensive clinical trial or anything, but this is a promising result that by using this device, people can get uh, restored gait that's a mobility level that's uh, more similar to what they had before the amputation than what they can get with passive prostheses. Um, yeah, so that's a, let's see, that's the uh, human trials. Um, and so kind of moving away from the paper a little bit now. So this paper explains the device, um, how the device was designed, what the performance of the device is, and I really uh, enjoyed working on that. And uh, I think it's very nice. Um, but what I'm really excited about is the things that this device enables. So now, because we have this knee and this ankle that matches uh, the weight of microprocessor devices. So these are devices that people have that they're used to the weight of. Um, it matches the weight and size of those. So it's very easy now to do trials where we try and push these devices, develop control algorithms for them and uh, get some um, real data on how these devices can help people because we don't know. So this field is um, has been around for about 20 years now, but we still, there's been no study that's shown that a powered knee prosthesis actually helps people walk. And that's due to uh, primarily, I think, to uh, no prosthesis having the ability to help people walk yet. So we're hoping with this device um, that we've kind of overcome that barrier. And now we can start uh, providing this data and adding to the body of, of knowledge about what power prostheses can actually do. Um, so we actually are, we have a grant to take these devices and send them home with amputees for three weeks. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and that's part of why this design has, we, we worked really hard on a lot of aspects of the design to all the wires are concealed. There's no pinch points. Um, it's very robust. And uh, part of the reason for that is so that we can send a home with people for three weeks and measure their, uh, how many steps they take, measure um, different metrics of their ambulation ability and use that to determine, does this device actually help somebody in the real world or not? Um, so that's a, I guess, 30 minute overview of uh, this paper. I don't think I hit everything, but it's hard to hit everything in 30 minutes. Um, yeah, any, any questions, discussion points? 
yeah, thank you so much for giving us the this overview um, of the work and the development and the analysis like you did beforehand, the modeling and prediction. Uh, it's really interesting to learn about that and um, which components, you know, were important to have, you know, less strain on battery and so on. I, I you know, I don't think I thought about this before. And it's really beautiful that the Slack basically gives additional strength um, to the user. Um, it, that is really exciting. And um, do you, since you started talking about the clinical trials, did you see just by using this um, lag that there's some recovery process going on but because you know i don't know if you know uh, miguel nocolili's work with the um, exoskeleton during the um, world soccer world cup where they kicked yeah. basically the ball and there was um, very surprisingly a recovery going on for paralyzed people by using those legs. Oh. But, but they had sensors that kind of gave a feedback into the arm, for example, or to mm -hmm. a place where they still had sensory input. So, yeah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> that, yeah, no, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, this... The, we haven't seen any recovery, um, but that's a hard thing, I think, for, for amputees to have. There is a lot to be said for keeping muscles strong. And so by using this uh, device, for instance, I guess I maybe didn't um, highlight the downsides of the devices people use currently enough. But so with, a, with passive devices, with these microprocessor devices that exist on the market, uh, you, you can't get any power with the device. So if you put your weight into it, if you're walking upstairs, for instance, and you put your prosthesis on the step in front of you and you try to go up it, it doesn't give you any power. So people don't do that. So there's a lot of activities that people just don't do with that leg because the knee isn't there to provide power. And so with this device, the knee can provide power. And so we hope that because the knee has power, people can use this uh, use this device to strengthen their leg and and uh, have muscles activated that aren't activated with their regular with their with their prescribed prosthesis or with prostheses that have been available uh, previously. So we're hopeful that that um, is the case and we, haven't yet uh, finished any studies looking at um, muscle strength in the leg. So I'm not sure what the outcome of that would be. Yeah, that's really interesting. And yeah, I guess this case is very different. Um, do you have maybe also patients that have chronic pain um, issues and I don't know, but I could imagine that by kind of distracting the neurons to do stuff again, uh, that maybe chronic pain issues could go down, but it's maybe too far-fetched, but it would be nice. I know that Miguel Nicolides, it took like over a year to see those effects. Um, yeah. So I don't know how, yeah. how long that would take. Chronic pain is a... Uh difficult not to cry or you're talking about like phantom limb pain is that correct where, where if somebody has an amputation they still feel pain in the limb or part of their body that was amputated yeah exactly for example or yeah. also then yeah there's also a lot of chronic pain additionally elicited due to prostheses that don't fit exactly well and kind of irritate on top i think that's a yeah. indirect contributor yeah so um for prosthesis fit there's 
being having a lightweight device device helps because if you have a really heavy device uh, and you have to that's pulling on your socket all the time, then it can exacerbate uh, any issues that you have with the fit of the device on your leg. Um, so lightweight helps with that. And for chronic, uh, for for phantom limb pain, um, it's not necessarily my area of study, but there is some interesting work being done on reinnervating the nerves um, that lead to the affected area. And so you can hook those up to a prosthesis and you can get some um, feedback from them. So I, Jake George, for instance, uh, and several other research groups are, are looking at this. Um, and you can actually get some, uh, connect those nerves up to signals in the prosthesis and that is shows some promise in helping reduce this pain because you're giving those nerves a function again instead of um, having them just hang out in the end of a limb and not really being connected to any sensory inputs. I'll ask one more question and then I'll let Den Dennis um, came up to the stage and, and Joyce, um, we are trying to bring you up if you're listening but it's not working so maybe if you would restart the app then uh, it will work. Um, so because you told us, um, you know, about your story and uh, your mother, um, would it be a big deal, <laughs> probably it is, to turn this into an exoskeleton to um, help paralyzed people moving well? Because I thought maybe the requirements, you know, to have the joints characteristics you um, designed with your colleagues that maybe they would also be very helpful for some type of exoskeleton device. Yeah, uh, that's, it, it does take a lot of work, um, but that's a good point. And that's actually something we're working on right now. So somebody else in the lab, uh, Brandon is, so I'm, I'm still in the lab that, that developed this. I graduated, but I stayed on as a research scientist. Um, and Brandon is uh, taking the same torque sensitive actuator design that I talked about for the knee and using it in the, for a knee exoskeleton. So we do think it shows promise there because it is a solution that's lightweight and small. I mean, that matters a lot also for exoskeletons. So, there are exoskeletons that exist for spinal cord injury um, that are quite large and heavy and not, I mean, it's a hard problem, but, but um, not necessarily easy to walk with. And so we, we think that if we can make the actuator smaller and lighter, that will help the, the problem. Um, yeah, so it is, it is applicable. And to more also than just spinal cord injuries, there's a, um, if you can, there, there are many health conditions such as stroke um, or brain injury where part of your body function is affected. You, so you still have the limb, but you just can't use it very well. And we think that exoskeletons could be a promising solution to uh, address that. So help people with stroke, for instance, walk faster um, and thus be able to go around the community easier and, and uh, stay home less. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And do you know if for um, guiding basically or um, controlling the exoskeleton, if um, they're using brainwave activity, like through a helmet, basically, signal? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, that's great. We, we aren't looking at that. I, there are some groups who are interested in that, but I think that's still very far away. So, uh, like, EEG, the, these helmets that, that look at your brain waves <clears throat> um, can be it's not a very well-known science yet. So there's still a lot of um, 
one common approach to that is to take the information that you get from this sensor about the brain waves, kind of feed it into some machine learning algorithm, essentially, and you get out with, with some information about what parts of the brain do what, and you get out uh, what the person wants to do. And to really control an exoskeleton and be able to assist somebody, you need something that's a little more uh, more consistent, more reliable. And one of those options is electromyography, um, EMG, which is, it doesn't look at the brain waves, but if you flex your muscle, uh, any muscle in your body, there's some voltage that's created on the skin from the activation of that muscle. And you can actually read that voltage uh, that's created on the skin and sense that the person is activating their muscle. And you can use that with exoskeletons. That's a really nice tool. So if they have some ability to flex, so for instance, with somebody who survived a stroke, uh, if they have some ability to flex a muscle on their leg, you can hook up this sensor to that muscle. And then when they flex that, you can have the exoskeleton assist them. So you can make up for all the other, other muscles that aren't working or the muscles that aren't working to their full capacity. Um, so that's a really nice control avenue for exoskeletons. That's uh, really great. And it also should be, if I'm still up to date on that type of research, interestingly, um, the individual characteristic of each person, how people switch the muscle, like how the signaling is, mm -hmm. is very different from person to person. So it would be additionally kind of a security, you know, cyber security. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know if I'm still yeah. up to date, but I read that, you know, people wanted to use that signaling instead of like EGs and to let's see uh, to analyze for example how stressed people are or you know other different type of states like body states and it they couldn't because each individual has such a variety of signals characteristic ones that uh, the noise is just too big to like discern groups basically so would be interesting if that could be additionally also a security thing. So. Yeah, I mean that is that is security on one hand, but on the other hand, it's nice from a from a translational perspective. Uh, if your device works on everybody very easily, then you need less clinical time to get it set up. Um, you need less uh, personalization. And then um, that means everything's cheaper, right? Because healthcare, at least you know, in, in the United States is very expensive. So um, that's something we push for on the prosthetic sides of things, especially for things that we think are, are close to translation is we try um, really hard only to design control algorithms that are easily translatable from person to person, because if it takes an hour to get this device set up on somebody and make it work, uh, then because you have to you know, personalize everything and tune it just for them, uh, then that, that makes it really hard to make that useful in the real world. So. Um, yeah. I mean, you could probably at home with an AI, you know, type of thing, train it yourself maybe. But that's true, and that's why I have more hope for engineering solutions than organic solutions to like regrow stuff, mm -hmm. body parts, and even organs, because that's the pro we didn't figure out how to make cells that you can put into everyone yet. Like we would just reject them, but you know, artificial hearts right. are working pretty well. Um, you know, without having to take heavy medications. So um, hopefully, you know, the engineering um, world, you know, if I would put money on it, I would, <laughs> I would put all the money into that research, like 
artificial kidneys, not not from cells, from you know whatever yeah. engineering materials you would need probably, and then replace them like a pacemaker once in a while. But yeah, I, I'm not sure if we can ever solve the immune response um, issue to make it cheap enough that you can scale it for everyone off the shelf. I, I don't think organic will work, but yeah. I mean, hopefully, hopefully one day. I mean, yeah, that's something I is that is nowhere near uh, being close, and also not my field of research. But yeah, regrowing a limb or something would be very nice if it worked. But um, I I agree that it's, it's not close. Yeah. So yeah. Um. Sorry for taking over a little bit. Um. Here, but um, Denise and Kirko, please go ahead with your questions. And Victoria, if you have more questions, please go ahead too. Thank you. Kirko, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I I can't lie, I not my field, but super cool. Uh, but I was kind of curious, like about these two things. One, uh, is it possible? Because like uh, I saw that there's like some electrical components to the limb um, or the prosthetic, uh, and I was kind of curious. Is it possible? Because you know, like when you walk, that motion is moving the stuff on a torque side is it possible kind of like how some like electric cars uh kind of can recharge off of the the torque created from like the the brakes or something like that i can't remember exactly how it works but is it i was kind yeah. of curious to, if, if it's possible that that motion of walking and stairs and so on and so forth can help charge the electrical components of the prosthetic yeah that's a that's a great question and that's actually something um that we showed in the first time for this paper. So that is possible. Uh, and you can, if you basically turn the motors um, to just resist movement really hard, it's the same thing as braking in, in electric cars. Is you, know, you have the exact right uh, analogy there, or I mean, not even analogy, it's the same mechanism. Um, you can, if you walk on the knee and we set the knee to just break, the whole time and not give you any power, then you do actually recharge the batteries. And there's a whole supplemental materials uh, paper that goes along with this that I don't know an easy way to get access to right now. Um, because I think the link that I sent only shows this, but um, but this, this leg is able to do that. And that's something that you need, uh, one, it's really good for amputees, because if you have a device that only works when it's powered, you know, when there's when there's a charge in the battery uh, and it's possible for the battery to deplete all the way, and then you have to find an outlet somewhere to, to recharge it, um, that's a frustrating thing. So by doing, by using this mode, it's possible to put, basically just have the device break all the time. So it's much harder to walk. It doesn't assist you anymore, but you can still walk around with it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it, it can do that. Super cool. I have like one more question though. Yeah. So, um, how do I uh, state this? Um, what it kind of seems like when you were talking about how you can go like, uh, I think it was like high torque, low speed, and then vice versa. And that kind of mm -hmm. can help dictate like uh, the speed of which a person can move or, or the amount of force they can put down, like walking upstairs or something like that. I'm trying mm -hmm. to understand in my own language. Um, but yeah. uh, I was kind of curious that if you can kind of get that type of control as you go through like the programming on how things change depending on the motion and so on and so forth, if it's possible to like be able to like, I guess like, you know, like I'm thinking sports wise, right? Uh, you have to be able to like stop, start, um, put different amounts of pressure on the inside, outside, front and back of your foot. Uh, mm -hmm. to be able to do certain movements is it possible that something like that could be like programmed in because it, it almost seems like this could be like part of like a new way to for like um um like special olympics type sports for like people with uh disabilities like missing limbs you have like sprinting of course already but uh you're, you know what I'm saying? Using, like using this leg more for um sports or for like extreme activities rather than just getting you know going up some stairs yeah like like exactly. just i don't know man like it kind of seems like there there is a a 
definite application from how I'm understanding, like maybe not so now, but as you can continue to uh, make advancements upon uh, how the actual uh, prosthetic works, that that's yeah. like a definite avenue. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really exciting avenue for it. Um, and the thing that the field is waiting on for that, uh, I think more, I think these mechanics can handle it. Um, especially in the knee. I mean, I'm talking mostly about the knee because uh, it has a bigger impact, I think, in, in folks' quality of life than the ankle does. Um, so, but, but with the knee, and I think it's a little farther, it's closer to, to being translatable to a real product than the ankle is. I think the ankle still has some steps. But so I, I, I think the knee is pretty close, um, the mechanics. But the really, the hard part left for that is controls. So, if you're talking start stop, you're talking these, you know, there's the like football exercise where you go through the you step through the tires. I don't know what that's called, um, but but some activity like that, which this leg could give you the ability to do. We still don't have the ability to control the leg to make it do that. So uh, there's a lot of different avenues, and that's kind of what several folks in our lab are working on. Um, as well as these different avenues of how do you get the leg to do what the user wants instead of just what's programmed in as like walk stairs up stairs down go up ramps go down ramps these kind of set activities you know if you want to do some crazy movement with your leg or like a karate kick currently they can't do that um and so I, I, yeah one promising method for that i think is um emg control so what i talked about again where you can measure muscle movement uh, or like if somebody's flexing their muscles, you can put those sensors on the um, person who's using the prosthesis, like in their socket on the residual limb, and you can get a lot of information from that. So hopefully, you know, in the future, um, we can see cool sports activities like that. Uh, but also from a, from a science standpoint and from a clinical standpoint, we spend some energy on that, but the focus of it is just on helping people get up off the couch because that's really where the quality of life um, impacts come in. I think more if you're a young, a, you know, young strong amputee, you can do a lot of these activities. Uh, but it's the folks who have diabetes, they're older, uh, don't walk around much, that really see these negative impacts after an amputation. And so we're trying on the clinical side to uh, address those. Legit. Thanks for asking my questions. Yeah. Hi, Lucas. Thanks for this really interesting talk. I had um, a couple of questions. The exoskeleton one was asked. So I was curious, what is the weight of these units? And you had mentioned that so far you, they're still tethered. What would it take to, and how much energy usage is there and what would it take to untether them? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I think the tethering, I was unclear. That was um, like 20 years ago when people first started developing these devices. So these, the device that's shown in this paper is fully untethered. Uh, you don't need a laptop or anything. Um, it can just ambulate uh, on its own. So it has all the batteries, controls, electronics, everything is inside the device. Um, and the... Sorry, I forgot the first part of your question. Uh, it was about um, the energy usage. So now that they oh, are yeah. fully self-contained, what, what's the operational time? Yeah. Uh, so with these devices, you get uh, maybe half a day on them uh, with the batteries that we have. and. That's actually kind of independent of how much you walk on it because a lot of the, for these specific devices, a lot of the energy just goes to the electronics because we didn't take time to really fine tune all the electronics. The motor driver has pretty high power requirements even when you're not driving the motor. Um, it's always on a hot standby basically. Exactly, yeah. And so you don't get very much, but if you take, this same design and and but even with that 
uh, I think we estimate, we didn't actually have somebody walk on it this long, but something like 10,000 steps. And in this battery recharging mode that I mentioned earlier, you can walk indefinitely, right? Because in, then you're not consuming the battery because you're actually recharging it enough to, uh, to that, that you're not lowering the battery voltage over time if you are walking on it. Um, and that those plots are shown in the supplemental materials, which I should have provided a link to. Um, but if you have a way to get that, whatever way is, you know, however you can get your hands on it, you can see the plots where the battery um, voltage goes up. But uh, I think even if you just take this device right now, how it is, um, in terms of physical mechanics, you just improve the electronics, you could get uh, a day of walking and uh, so, so it's, I think it would be possible to sell it as a device. And then people just have to plug it in um, overnight, every night. And then that's the case. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, on that, on that kind of topic of more usability of the device, we're working. So we just signed a partnership with Autobach. They licensed this. Um, torque sensitive joint and we're working with them. They're, they're the largest prosthetics manufacturer in the world, they're based out of Germany. We're working with them to take this device and translate it into a device that can be sold on the market. Um, so we're hopeful, it's very hard to predict the timeline on these things, um, but a couple years till we can see this device out there. Nice, are you getting, uh, are you getting interest from exoskeleton vendors or you know other actors um yes well in that i guess autobach is also uh designing exoskeletons um and so we don't have anything nearly as formal with them in terms of of taking this device and bringing it to market for the exoskeleton side of things uh, but we're trying to work on seeing what possibilities there are in terms of, of uh, commercialization of the technology on the exoskeleton side. What do you think is a time frame for commercialization of exoskeletons? I understand that they're, um, you know, they're being, yeah, yeah actually, uh, yeah, tell me, tell me whatever you can. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a hard question. So I'm a bit of a technology pessimist, maybe, um, in that I, I, need to be convinced that I, that a technology uh, provides really a lot of, of help to somebody for them to want to include it in their life in their lives right because charging another device and having that like mental labor of oh my is you know is it acting weird is it not um, it takes a lot from somebody so for exoskeletons I don't see you know there are companies right now selling them uh, you can go Rome robotics sells one that you know makes it reduces loading on your knee when you're skiing, um, unless they discontinued or changed their, their approach on that. But um, I haven't seen a really clear path forward in the exoskeleton department for devices that you take home with you and you wear every day. And I think that just comes down in my mind, again, to, to size and weight and difficulty. So if it's something that's really easy to do, uh, people will be more likely to include it in their lives, but it's not at the point where prostheses are um, in terms of benefit to cost in a person's life. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's still a lot of science to be done and a lot of questions to be answered about what are the areas in which people need to be helped with exoskeletons. And then we can focus on addressing those areas. Yeah, find the find the need first, then then design the solution. Yeah. Right on. Thanks, Lucas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for answering all these questions. Um, I really like the point you made that um, I think we are only transitioning now very slowly to really asking people what they actually need. 
improved in their lives. I think a lot of stuff used to be designed by people that have nothing to do with the problem. They just imagine that this is what people should need. <laughs> I don't know if you realize that, but... Um, yeah, I, I yeah. think it's common in engineering uh, to... Because engineering is fun to kind of find a solution. You know, you have a solution that you like and then try and find a problem for it. Um, and that doesn't lead to good results or, or things that are applicable um, or that, that help people in the real world. But yeah, I think people are moving, the field is moving away from that. Yeah, and um, I think it's really, yeah, I think that's that's a really positive transition and I'm really looking forward to the future um, where, you know, people's needs are met um, and using all the technology development we have to help people have a better quality of life. So uh, congratulations for doing this work and, um, and developing these. I think it will help a lot of people and I hope it goes fast um, to, you know, have these legs on the market and, um, yeah, developing many more very useful, cool tools. Um, so do you think, yeah, the, the military, I think Kiko's question, I was thinking also about that. That's maybe my last question that you could enhance people's abilities quite a lot or, or you could use this technology also to improve robots. Um, is there anything also going on in that direction in your lab to, you know, just improve how legs work in robots and, and how they move? And because I, I guess by the usage, just from the usage of your robotic legs, that data could maybe be a training data for robots to walk well in different types of, you know, surfaces and, and agility, I guess. Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question. We, the field right now uh, is relatively separate. So in terms of humanoid robotics or, or robotics, um, something like Boston Dynamics, or uh, agility robotics their robots versus us um, don't really uh, know i guess the yeah i don't know the, the the fields are relatively separate so i think that there are things from this to design and from prosthetics that could be applied to help humanoid robots and i'm um, probably some other things that could translate the other way as well. But I don't know enough about that field to say uh, what exact, you know, what I think exactly from this design. I mean, I think the torque sensitive actuator, I guess, um, could be useful in humanoid robots to get higher torque with a smaller design. Um, but in terms of controls and, and data sets, uh, uh, yeah, it's hard. I don't know what would help them uh, come up with better designs or have devices walk smoother. Well, I'm telling you why I had right away almost that idea when I read your paper, when we had a lot of time on our hands here on Clubhouse and we used to talk for a whole day sometimes. We came up with what would be the best way to make us basically immortal the best way would actually be to just keep the brain young. The rest is kind of a waste of resources, right? So you could have all these immortal brains stored in a very safe place away from radiation and everything and just have those humanoid robots walk yeah. around for you <laughs> and give you yeah. all the input and, you know, travel through space wherever. <laughs> it's true. I mean, this would, you don't have any oxygen requirements for this. So if you want to go to space uh, with your robot body, you know, this could be a good leg. This could be a promising leg. To use. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so we have a leg. 
yeah. now we just have to figure we'll out how to you know it kind of futurama type of way just you sit in a glass yeah. but you have your robot walk around for you i think yeah the rest of the body is kind of a waste you know to keep that alive <laughs> but you couldn't yeah. eat chocolate could you well, the robot oh. could, and if the sensors are good enough, it gives you the way the same kick, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Well, there's yeah, a lot we have to solve, yeah. but anyways, we have the legs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, this still club us. We can we can goof around a little bit. <laughs> yeah, unless anyone else has a last question. Um, does anyone please, uh, you know, signal? If not, we'll um, close the room, Lucas. It was such a pleasure having you here. This is really exciting work um, for many reasons, but especially for the reason to help people um, improve their quality of life. So congratulations, and I hope, you know, we'll keep following the work and you know i hope a lot of funding and you know a lot of people helping will will lead to more progress so we are curious it's always hopeful to have these rooms to be hopeful about the future so thank you <laughs> yeah and thank you for the invitation i appreciate it great and thanks everyone for coming and asking questions and commenting it's always way more fun um, and better discussion if people uh, participate live. And uh, if you like discussions like this, we'll have the next room later in the week. Um, and um, the the researchers did um, reanalyze um, DNA from 18th century African descendants and uh, discovered um yeah new um new like revealed new origins and new information um so i think that will be really it's a very different type of research but it will be also really interesting so thank you lucas thank you everyone for coming and i'm closing the room in three two one bye everyone thank you